Welcome home, dearest Brava baby, to Do You Believe in Brava, the interview series where I, Talia Brava, personal growth leader of the next generation, meet with stars from across the spiritual, personal world to try their practices, feel their vibe, and most importantly, ask them, do you believe in Brava, in Brava, in Brava, in Brava? So this is my altar's aunt, Molly Moynihan. Molly Moynihan is a writer. She is a person who has done copious amounts of work on her personal and personal growth, who has been an icon to the altar and really a guiding point as an artist. And I don't just say that. So my darling, I want to begin by just letting you introduce yourself to the Broad Baby Cult community. Anything you'd like to share about who you are, what brought you here to this very beautiful moment. Hi, Brava Babies. Uh, Talia Brava is one of my favorite people in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply um, impressed with what she has to say mm -hmm. and how she helps people. Um, what got me to this place in the universe? I uh, started writing when I was like in fourth grade. <laughs> I just kept going and then I started teaching and I got married a couple of times and finally ended up in where we are right now in Chicago. I love it. So, my darling, as we think about writing as personal growth and your process of writing, what has writing been to you throughout your life? I actually found this uh, stapled together loose leaf pages from a notebook, which was called um, The Collected Works of Mary Ellen Moynihan, which was my christened name. <laughs> and in it, I apparently felt that I had to write poetry for like all occasions. And so one was about getting the cast off my broken arm. Mm. One of the lines was, um, I say goodbye to you, my cast, you white villain of plaster. Oh. I say goodbye to you, my cast. This is from your master. Oh, oh that was really that's pretty a child. good. <laughs> yes, so and deep. Then one was to our dead cat. Oh. Um, we tended to have like a lot of cat fatalities because you remember the road or yes, we yes. grew up on. Busy road. So I had one to my cat, Red. I had a cat named Red, Red, Red. The school bus ran him over. Now he's dead, dead, dead. Red, Red, Red was fat, fat, fat. The school bus ran him over. Now he's flat, flat. So let's say that this child, Molly Moynihan, was intrigued by darkness and it fueled her art. Oh, totally. And did that carry through? Yes. So I kept reading aloud Edgar Allan Poe, and I loved the poem The Highwayman. That's the black eyed. Innkeeper, yeah, the black-eyed innkeeper's daughter is in love with the highwayman, and in order to warn him away from coming to get her because there's a trap for him, she shoots herself. <clears throat> she's been tied up because she's not supposed to warn him, but she's, she's got a rifle. <laughs> she mm -hmm. shoots herself. So I used to read aloud obituaries and those, that kind of poetry to our cleaning ladies, <gasps> and um, they, would, <laughs> they would always be really nice. But... <laughs> I think they probably wondered, and I used to read obituaries and, and have like, oh, she's really young. Oh, they, this person died in a really terrible way. So yeah, I was kind of a morbid child. Mm. What do you think that impulse was? I mean, I was six when John Kennedy was assassinated and it was the first time I saw my mother cry and the whole country went into this kind of deep mourning. So my father was this amazingly funny, wonderful guy, and brilliantly intellectual, and, and a writer also, and a teacher, a professor of English, but he had a real dark side. Yeah. And I saw it as a little kid, and it scared me. I was obsessed with Dracula, which I'm sure is something sexual. My oldest sister, who who's died, I had a dream, <laughs> I had a dream once that I recited at the dinner table. I woke up, and I was in my nightgown, and I went downstairs and went out the back door, and there was like this, there was grass, and it was all dewy. My nightgown was like right to the top of the grass, and I was running through the grass, and then there was a snake, and so my sister, I didn't know what she meant, but I remember saying, that's a completely Freudian dream. Uh. And I read Women in Love when I was 11. We weren't allowed to watch TV. We, we went to a lot of movies. I loved James Bond. Yeah. I loved like weird, <laughs> I went to all these weird foreign films because we lived abroad and we used to take ocean liners to get there and we would just sneak into these movies that were like 
not appropriate for children. We saw Federico oh. Fellini movies, Giulietta the Spirits. I didn't understand them per se, but I knew something really interesting was going on. I read Women in Love and I got it. It's written quite simply. But like I came up with this idea that men and women were put in each other's lives to destroy each other. Yeah. So it's such a romantic <laughs> upbringing. I think along with romance, there is darkness, right? Darkness. If there was a horrible gift in, in your childhood, what would that have been? Well, my parents were beautiful. They were really gorgeous. And they were funny as hell, which, you know, to me, that's really important, that humor mm -hmm. in the dark. Mm -hmm. The things that matter to me is that is survival and laugh you know humor not laughter i'm not a comic but i try to in my writing i usually find ways to lighten up whoever you know because there's always somebody somebody always dies in yeah. my books they're brilliant i mean the thing was you never i was at a party last night and um i'm afraid i was like book name dropping because <laughs> it was normal yeah like this yeah. person i know who's an english teacher she hasn't really read much of any of the canon, which I get. I don't know that you have to, but I've read everything. Yeah, it's like, it's like doing ballet bar yes, as a dancer. Yes, so yeah. my dad and my mother were just really well-educated and fascinating. And yes. they were really, they loved their jobs. They loved what they, I don't even, we didn't even call them jobs. So mom, being an architect, she was like completely immersed in that. And seeing that was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. It was also hard, because I wanted her to be like at home making cookies. Mm -hmm. She never was, yes. in an apron. Yes. I mean, anytime she was supposed to pick me up, I'd come outside, she wouldn't be there. I even think that with my son, I was a little more hands-on. I was a lot more hands-on. But like I made him take the train to school. And I have to say, fast. back then, being a bad mother was a revolutionary yeah. act. That was totally. so feminist to be like. Yeah, she didn't drive us anywhere ever. Yeah. They actually told us we should hitchhike mm. or get the bus. And, that, the and bus. that has traveled through the lineage. That idea of just go for it, just do your thing. It's a good thing. Fiercely yeah. independent. Who did you have to be inside your family dynamic? When we had that crazy um, family picture taken where I'm just staring into the camera because mm -hmm. that's what the person told us to do. Mm -hmm. It's black and white. They're all in turtlenecks, the straight face, very Adam's family. Very Adam's Everyone family. looks touched by darkness. At that time, my father dubbed me the bad seed. Have you read the bad seed? No, I haven't. So the bad seed is this horror story where this child is born to a mother who doesn't, has blanked out her past, which was her mother killing all the children and not her because she hid in the fields. And then her daughter turns out to be like a murderer. Well, they say the, the best of us don't usually survive great ordeals. It's the, the altruistic often go down. So, so that was the bad seed survive. So daddy called me that. And he also, mm. later in life, he called me the bolter. But I was kind of a bolter. Like my family loved to sit around the dining room table and endlessly discuss things that I believe at a certain point were, which just didn't interest me, mm -hmm. like what was going on in the troubles in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Both my sisters loved to engage, and so I would clear the table, load the dishwasher, and go outside a lot of times, or go to my room. So really. Yeah. And I just read your article on, on the HuffPost, you guys can look at it, on being silent. And it's such a medicine for us because we come from such a verbal I environment. And so it sounds like you as a survival mechanism knew that you needed to take your space. Yes. And maybe that was called bolting, but I think that sounds very healthy. It was, it was healthy. Even at 15, I went off with my friend and we rode bikes for um, six weeks in an AYH trip with a bunch of other kids, but you were alone a lot on your bike. Really liked that. And I also liked leaving. <laughs> I was very into leaving. I wrote a lot of letters, like tons and tons of letters, but yeah. I needed to get away. Yeah, and when you think about yourself as a writer, it does require solitude. I mean, everything I stream through me comes through me, sounds editing, but in terms of reading, I only read my own content because just like Willow and Jaden Smith, I write books, I don't read books. Oh, that's, yes, that's so interesting. Because mm -hmm. as a writing teacher, the first thing I ask people is, you know, what, what are they reading, how much they read. Mm -hmm. Especially it's I all lost for me unless they're reading Bravo content. Um, interesting. I read all the time because we weren't allowed to watch TV. Mm -hmm. We grew up basically in the sticks. And there was no social media. No social media, none. 
we had one, did we have one phone? I think we had one phone on the kitchen wall for a really long time. And it was before um, answering machines. So the phone had a very sort of, like if someone called during dinner, you just didn't answer the phone yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Though my mom had this one woman who always called her during dinner and she used to make me answer it. It was lonely. I was very lonely yeah. as a child. And what do you, what's your relationship with loneliness? Because I struggle with this. I feel like I need to be connected to my brow babies. I get so much adoration. I get so much love. I'm, my cup is full of when I'm in the presence of you streaming me. At the same time, I feel like as an artist, like when I go to write my book at Brava, when I go to get my channel messages, I need to be alone. So in terms of your own self-care, your own process as an artist, what's your relationship with being alone? It's hard, but I've always wanted to have times when that that's, it's a little bit like in the HuffPost thing where silence is actually silence. It's not whispering, it's silence. Over the years, I have, um, I lived in a Buddhist monastery off and on for two years mm -hmm. as a group, but you didn't, you like made no eye contact. You had a very private life in, within this um, community. With writing, I have gone away. Um, what I do, what my normal routine is, is to wake up usually before anybody else. In this case, my husband, who either is at work or he sleeps till God knows. And I, the morning is really important mm, to me. Precious. It's quiet. And one thing that used to happen with my mom is she'd be so, like, she wakes up at breakfast, she wants to have full-fledged conversations. And I found that very hard. Yes, usually some I'm people just, can do that. It's yeah. exhausting for me because we're a charm offensive. So when we're on, we're on. And we're off or off. So I get up maybe 5.36 and I'll have my coffee. And that's usually when I write. I'm that's the same way. I, I can write in the morning. Right in the afternoon. No, no the afternoon late, and as the day goes on. And I don't know. Some, in some ways, I think it might be age now. But I never was. I used to always work out like 2, 3 o'clock because that was kind of, it was over yeah. as far as the writing. Yeah, because I think when I'm in the dream state, I'm more creative. Yeah. So it's almost like staying in there longer. That's a really good point. Thank you. I like that you should bring me into your students so I can teach them. I know. Well, John Gardner, who's this amazing, amazing writing teacher, that's what he t talked about as being the ideal writing state, was to be where it just flows. He, he says it much better. Unfortunately, he's dead, but he was killed on a motorcycle when he was really young. But he's in Providence. God big, big um, influence on my writing. And he talks about the reader getting into that state, reading you. So that you may actually, and this has happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to you, except you don't read, uh, where, yes, you read your stuff, which yeah. is important, but you're reading something and you think something happened, but you've added that in your mind. And when you go back to reread, because sometimes you go back and reread a book that you love, like Little Women, or yep. it's not there. And so it happened while you were reading. So it's a creative act. It's a connection. Yeah, because you're creating the movie in your head and you watch exactly. it and you read it. It's hard for me to just talk about reading when I don't really do it, but that's okay. We can talk about it. Okay, thanks. Great. <laughs> As you know, because you do follow Brava. I do. And so you are blessed and you will be coming to Providence with us. Ooh, yes. I'm so, I'm so happy you're on board. Oh. My birth mother, she's not yet, so she'll, we'll, she'll we'll get there. We'll figure it out. <laughs> hey, darling, when you think about the fact that this incarnation, it's a place where we learn karmic lessons on how to love Brava better. better. It's basically a big school room. Then we go back to Providence to live the beauty of Brava. So when you think about this incarnation as a, as a classroom of sorts, what would you say this life has been a lesson in? Mm. Such a great question, Thank Talia. You. It's hard to believe that you don't read. <laughs> to tell you the truth, it's been a hard year for the world, I think. Mm -hmm. and I am in a program where they talk about higher power, and I've never believed in a named sort of thing, but it, it, it was always love, and then it's, it's been writing and stuff like that. But I think that what has taught me that kindness and in some ways consistency, showing up and being part of other people's lives, which goes against the grain for me, because I kind of feel like going off and not being there. Motherhood taught me that too. Kindness and constantly staying awake in terms of 
of learning stuff. Learning stuff, mm -hmm. really important. Really, Continue really important. present yeah. and showing up. Present and showing up. And also, ta I hate this one, but taking, <sighs> admitting when you're wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Not that I'm ever wrong. Oh, no, me neither. Me neither. Wrong. Me neither. It's crazy never how I look wrong. back at my track record and I'm like, how does one person, yeah. like, never, never, never fuck up and yet everything that happens to yeah. me. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. really? It's very Christ like. I mean, it's a textbook. Oh. Me and my brother are the same. He's suffering. Yeah, no one knows that is the trouble. Well, I know that now. Thank you. I will um, pray for. Talia Brava does not suffer. And you're really paying for yourself because as you know, the only law right. of the universe are, is how Brava feels. It affects everything. Right. So if you want important to stop the wildfires, let's make Talia oh, feel better. Get so much. Botox and then the fires are gone. You, you know? don't need Botox. Well, you yeah. have a smooth. There's nothing on your forehead. Oh, yet, thank lady. you, my darling. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll hold it close to my heart. So when you think about, you, you mentioned what, um, but being a mom has taught you. Did you always expect that you'd be a mother, or was that a support? Yes. So always. you had that gene. I loved children when I was a child. I was about to go have a baby on my own when I met Luke's father. Amazing. I was about to leave And he New has York. good genes. Handsome man. Beautifully handsome man, and, and smart, and good. Good, good person. I announced that. I was talking at a meeting, and I said that I was leaving New York to, to have a child alone. And he asked me out for coffee, <gasps> so that just... Oh, happened. who knew that I the know. opposite advice would serve so I well? Know. I Tell told, a man you're trying to get pregnant. I know. Yeah, and I told a friend of mine, I said, when I finished speaking, I literally said this, if there's anyone here who might have wanted to date me, they will never ask me out. That's he beautiful. Did. Looking at great loves in your life, what you can say thank you for, for that. I'm actually writing a new novel set in 1977, so that was when I was 20, and that was when a relationship that sort of defined the first love, and a love that, <laughs> I mean, there were times when I felt like we could die of love. I mean, it was very T.H. Lawrence. Yeah. I broke his heart, and then he did what he had to do, and he, so my heart got broken, but it was, I deserved him not wanting to stick around yeah. in any case. But from that point forward, I've been so lucky. I've been loved by a lot of different kinds of people in a way. Sometimes I had a guy who asked me to marry him who I had to tell he was gay. But we loved each other. We yeah. loved each other. That was what was going on. Yeah. And that was, I was just thinking about him the other day because I was putting something away and that's from like, oh my gosh, it's like 30. 30 plus years ago and I have this box he like flew over from London and proposed and see my, the gays I, do it all well even the proposal oh it was and he came with all these beautiful things and I have like one of the boxes that this jewelry came in and this book and all this you're like no way a straight man has done this I can't believe not that. the same way it was the most romantic thing ever oh. he didn't tell me but I had a gay roommate and after he went back to England my roommate said we love him but he's with his. He, he had his boyfriend there. He goes, we love him, Molly. He's gay. <laughs> and I sort of, I knew. Yes. But I was like, I'd been through the mill because I was married to someone who was physically abusive, and I was looking. At, I actually welcomed the non physical part of our relationship in yeah. some ways, which That's is probably healing. It was healing. Luke's father taught me you could end up not having the perfect marriage that you could divorce and that you could forgive everything. Possibly because it's the person that you had a child with, but also because you were healthy enough to know that it wasn't anybody's fault. That's huge. That was really hard. And do you feel like in learning that lesson with him, that's trickled out into your whole life of being able to see yes. other relationships? Now? Yes, so that's a great question. And also my new novel, which has not been published yet, and hopefully I'll find an agent for it, it's about a good marriage that fails, you know, a marriage that had all the reasons to happen. So I tend to write autobiographically. And that's the real shit. That's yeah. what really, because well, it's like the, the injustice of this incarnation, which is why we're leaving. Yes. People aren't going around for the most part trying to hurt each other, and most people are good, and life is surprising. I liked your last piece. Molly wrote a piece for the new year, which you should all read, Aww. preparing you for this last incarnate year about how you know I think what I took away from your last piece on your blog is it's easy to say like this is the lesson and this is the lesson and this is the positive this is the effect 
but life is way more complicated and only Brava doth know it and I only get little tidbits. Well, that's because you are who you are, Brava. Yeah, so well, because you know I am the channel of Bravo, which is God, so I only get little bits and I can barely keep up. I got it. You know, which yeah. is why I'm actually doing, you have to tune in on Monday, we're doing a session tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon on everyone learning to channel Bravo because I'm fatigued and I can't barely fit in my workouts. Oh, it's exhausting. It's when I met my husband, my third husband, <laughs> no, no, I'm getting married so often because I never really thought marriage was all that good. I'm very idea. Yes. I mean, I thought but, I'd be on my third marriage yeah, by now. So. Well, I wasn't, I was older than you. So okay, 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 you have time. Okay. You have time. Every year. <laughs> you have a year. <laughs> you have more than a year. Um, he, uh, our, the, I am not the person I was when I started out on this journey of being in a relationship. I mean, I was totally selfish and also convinced that it was sort of like a, com a contest almost, like who loved who more, and I always wanted to be loved more. That kind of horrifies me, but because it's not healthy, but I think it's pretty human. And it's a control issue. It's because, a control issue. Like, my Bravo babies are not my ideal man. They are like very subby, and I get that validation from them knowing like, I can do anything, I can like burp, and they're like, that's so cute. It's like actually really a turn on for a lot of them. Everything is a turn on in its own way. Everything just becomes a okay. thing. Right. It's very nice and I can control you completely through mind control, which is me grabbing the mic, mind control, isolation, mm -hmm. charismatic leader. Which is you are a, a miracle. I, Thank you. Yeah, like, I can feel but, it, by the way. That's really helpful to hear. <laughs> but when I look at who I want for my, my man, I think in order to have a great love, you have to be willing to lose that control, to have someone that you are maybe even feel fucking nervous about because, oh, if I lose them, I'm going to be upset. Right. But if you're not comfortable with that level of of letting go of control, then you can never have real love. I think that's true. And this will be a little bit of the downer side of that. It's just, I think as you get older, um, I'm 62 now, which I just Shock. can't believe. Not real. I can't believe it's been that like, wow. Because yeah. I was always the youngest. That journey. <laughs> that journey. But there's such vulnerability to age and to changing. Kind of like at, as each stage in your life, it's a different kind of vulnerability. When you were young, you were willing to fall in love with someone who's going to obliterate. Yeah, I think for That's the experience, how, just for the experience, me on this for ride. the feeling like you're totally fine with feeling like you're going to throw up all the time, yes. <laughs> or that you want to have sex all the time, whatever it yes. is. And then when you, if you do end up becoming a mother, which is what mine was, you don't have to ever become a mother or father. But if you do do that, the whole love thing just completely completely changes into something very different. That's, I think it makes marriage really hard because mm -hmm. it isn't about that. It's about the baby most of the time. And, but then that baby grows up and looks at you and says, okay, I have my own life. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. and Don't you have shit to do? Yep, I got stuff to do. Mm -hmm. I need to become rich and famous and mm -hmm. leave me alone. Then you're left in some ways. It, it, I knew about this a little. I think the loss of my sister helped me understand. My oldest sister helped me understand. For one thing, I made sure my son always had people that loved him that weren't just me. It was mm -hmm. really important to me. So like... I would bring him places and, and not say love my child, but let him be part of that and not get jealous and not get possessive because yeah. when my oldest sister died, her son was only three years old and she was the everything. And okay, so you're still kind of, you're, you're basically still the everything. And it wasn't that because no one expected that to happen, but because I lived through it, mm -hmm. I wanted my boy to be as, strong as possible even if I wasn't there mm, that's so, so real. there was that that's a whole nother kind of love and then the love I have for Timo my husband is it's it's profound and it's also it's also very it's it's doable because we give each other a lot of space mm. we pretty much love each other unconditionally I mean he's much better at it than I am he really truly thinks that I'm beautiful and wonderful and whatever and I, I have to admit I mean there are times when I I don't feel like any of that, but that is pretty much where we are. And I feel the same, or, or I feel, or I think sometimes he feels different because we're just there. We're each other's partners and it's fine. I never thought I would like this in, in a way because I never wanted to settle. It sounds like it's more about the consistency and like yeah. finding a deeper level of love that isn't about getting or, or winning or it's not a competition. Yeah. And that was a bit before. And the other thing is, is now I can write about it. 
The other thing, the crazy passion, which is what this 1977 novel, because mm. I finally realized I understood it, because I totally, le- I mean, I mm. left it behind a while ago. Then you could write about it. Right, because it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Like where you could get to, you know, in your 20s. Intoxicated. Yeah, but I think there's a big flame out with that. Yeah. I do. It can kill you. It's kind of like drugs. I mean, when I look at the Amy Winehouse documentary, the real thing there is love addiction. That yeah. is the thing that came about yeah. most clear. As well as the heroin. Yes. Yeah. And it was all intermingled. They, yeah, they share. Circling back to the idea of solitude, are you able to feel you are with Timo, but also like inside yourself and yes. not abandoning any? There's a privacy that actually goes back to my childhood. Like I always wanted my door closed Mm -hmm. and my sister usually had her door open, which of course is much nicer. (laughs) My room was like sanctuary Mm -hmm. and I still have that feeling about certain spaces. We just bought a house in in Michigan and, and, and it kind of the whole house of course, I have to let my husband mm-hmm. and friends and stuff yeah. and relatives. It's like vampires. Once you let them <laughs> in, they're like going to keep coming out. Exactly. I thought briefly when I was 20 that it was possible to disappear into... I, I was in a lot of pain, actually. I was pretty... My, um, my best friend was killed around that time. She was really important to me. And that was a... Di- you know, that was a really... She was a, a, obviously a woman and didn't have a sexual relationship, but I loved her so much. And it was unconditional. She was beautiful, and I didn't feel competitive with her, which is not always true. And she was good and funny, and I wanted her to be happy. And so that kind of started that process of real grief, understanding of grief. I was in a relationship that was going on at the same time, and it was just not something that would sustain real challenge Mm -hmm. but at the time I just thought if I can't make if this person won't stay I am gonna die and that didn't happen yeah I've sort of survived quite a few people I've had friends suddenly die who are too young and stuff like that so when you or go to Brava when you survive you also have to sort of figure out how to handle that because you do I feel that you owe life something. Oh. Even if it's just realizing, oh my God, 10 years ago, this person I cared about went, you know, had cancer or whatever, and they're not alive anymore. Yeah. Be aware of that. Mm-hmm. Not every day, yeah. but you know. The privilege of being here. Yeah. yeah, gratitude, which is, I wasn't really brought up to be very grateful. Yes. <laughs> it was much more about like, can you say something mean in a funny way? Right, that was mostly right. what we there was our a real, family taught us. Or can you do something spectacular mm-hmm. and then not show off? Produce. Uh, produce something and then amazing. understand that, you know, you understand your place in the hierarchy and keep working. of talent and yeah. go on. Yes. And yeah. yeah. You mentioned it has been a hard year for a lot of people in a lot of ways. It's been a lot of loss this year, and you just talked about, you know, the idea of grief and that that gratitude that you've learned through the process of saying goodbye to so many people. Knowing that we come from a family that did not believe in Brava, did not know Brava. I only recently found Brava. A very atheist background. What's your experience with with what you think happens after we pass? And you are free to be blasphemous in this space. Yeah, no, I will forgive you. you. Your great grandmother. Mom's mom told me when I was about five that I was the only one in the family that was not tarnished by sin. That if I prayed every night, I might save everyone. Otherwise, we were all going to hell. Do you think that she told all the girls? No, she told me. Only you. Because I was the only good one. Because I was the youngest. Oh, okay. And so I probably hadn't done anything. Like I don't know. I think stealing candy was mortal sin. Okay, Okay. great. So (laughs) she showed up like six months later and asked me about my prayer life. And seriously, I had all my stuffed animals. I was really into stuffed animals. Yeah. And I put all my stuffed animals in the bed. But I slept in the attic, which had no heat, and it was really cold in the wintertime. Our hair used to freeze to the pillow. She came to visit, and she asked me how I prayed, and then told me to show her. And I showed her, and I was kneeling on my nightgown, because it was wood floor. I had no rug. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in like a monk cell. Yeah. And she said it didn't count. <laughs> and I was like, I'm finished. You're a terrible human being. Okay, so I was told there was no God. I was told explicitly. It was hard, and when people died, I had a difficult, really difficult time because as we were taught, 
there was nothing. My spirituality, you know, it's uh, it's weird. It's like the ocean when I'm swimming, or any big, <laughs> any big body of water. When I swim, I feel connected to something much greater than myself. Mm -hmm. I feel cherished. Mm -hmm. I also uh, got sober when I was 26, and the higher power had to actually be sort of something, and it couldn't be you. Mm -hmm. You didn't believe in God, you had to, you didn't have to, but it helped. So I did the, the Buddhism helped because I forgave um, everyone mm -hmm. in my life and, and myself. I don't know why that I felt I was, both my friend and my oldest sister were killed in accidents that I had, I wasn't present and somehow I took it into myself that it, I was somehow part of it. Mm -hmm part of the cause. Mm -hmm. So I had all this guilt and remorse and anger, just so much anger. And it's so beautiful to, to, to realize that. I think we all think we're so intelligent. All of our babies think they're so smart. You are. Not. I'm sure you they're are. not smart. No, they're not. Don't but you should read. Don't tell them the thing. <laughs> but we, we think our logical mind, like, well, of course I am not a cause of this, so how could I feel guilty? But to actually get to the level of the child in us that has this belief that is not rational at all, and then and it's, work with the emotion. Right, and it's very ego-based. It's very, mm -hmm. like, nothing happens that you didn't cause. And mm -hmm. that happened with my sobriety when I did. There's steps in it. And one of the steps you do a complete inventory and when I looked at what I wrote I realized that yeah I thought everything good was my, but everything bad you know to the point of like war mm -hmm. and famine and wow yeah it was really so it's like no wonder you felt like a self-destructive gene very much so and yeah. the drinking for me was what, when I drank I just got angry <laughs> I mean I could be fun at a dinner party for maybe an hour yeah. or so but once I had enough in me, and you know, I'm allergic to alcohol as well, I think physically and mentally, so. because it, I got yeah. drunker than anybody else, and it didn't take that much. Yeah, you know, it, my eyes would glaze, whatever, but I would feel this incredible rage. Not only was I drunker than anyone else, I was a mean, mm. angry, cruel, because the gift of the yes. words had really failed me right away. Yes. It was sad. Yes. There's something in the, maybe the Irish lineage, my God. I, I just, think so my, my other side is Italian, my birth, my right. other, like, birth family is Italian, so they can drink and be fine. No, I've never seen it's any normal. of them drunk. Yeah, they just drink and it's fine. But I get like sad and victimy, and I just start looking around the room at who's hurt me. But I would get for I would get I would be like more like my father, which was he would rage. It's been a long time. I've been sober thirty five years this Amazing. December. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just I got sober young and stayed sober. So do you, when you look at that idea of love as being consistent and being present, do you feel like that day to day practice of sobriety has been a teacher in yes. that? Very much so. Yeah. Because it also is about staying right sized. I mean, there's a lot of these, I don't want to use too many buzz words from. We love program. buzz words. We we'll love just put Brava in front of it. Okay. Steal it. Brava, you know, okay. Brava staying right sized, except for you, who should be, you know, as large. That's my size. Yes, you're huge. But you're very petite. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that idea of being a worker among workers is another one that I hated. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter how I cut it, yeah, and I was brought up, I mean, we had such an odd paradox because you were more important, more beautiful, more capable than any child that had ever been born, and then you were nothing. You were nothing. And I would hang out with my n normal friends' parents and my normal friends, and their parents would just go about their business and... The kids would all go about their business and the parents would actually care about their homework and mm -hmm. whatever. <laughs> I would be bewildered because mm -hmm. it was kind of like, well, when does this show start? Yeah, exactly. You know? when it, what's my part? What yeah. should I do? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's, and it was a lot of I pressure. Think the, the greatest insult in our family was to be boring. So we, oh. that, that beyond being inappropriate, it's more if you're boring, that was the greatest sin. Totally. If I carried that into my, I probably still. Yeah. It's awful. Not only that, I also assume that people who are not engaging with like other people or me, they're bored. Mm -hmm. So I will like go up to someone who's perfectly okay just being there. Mm -hmm. I did this last time mm -hmm. and just barrage them mm -hmm. with attention, mm -hmm. which I realize at a certain point is probably kind of painful. But I can't help myself. It's yeah. like 
you're bored, which makes you boring. So yeah. I'm going to cure you. I'm going to bring you into the, the fold. I don't know, will I ever stop doing that? I mean, it makes me kind of a fun instinct. party guest. Yes. But also, like, this one friend of mine, I know she's just, you know, she's like in her 80, early 80s, and she was a teacher, and she's very serious and lovely. I just felt obligated mm -hmm. <laughs> to make everything It's your meaningful. job, having that ability with people and that ease and that ability to engage it as a gift. It so is. it's just it utilizing our gifts well and not abusing them. When you think about this last incarnate year, there is talk on the internet, people are like, oh no, we have more time. But really, truly, the truth is, whether you decide to accept it or you deny it, we have a year left. So we oh. look at it because we're rapturing November 3rd, 2020. Oh, I guess I knew that, but I forgot. I, no, well, it's, it's, in your, it's in your consciousness. Okay, which is not I, need to put, I have to put that on my calendar. Yeah, please, and just delete the Nothing I don't put on my calendar happens. Yes, what I rapture. often will do is I'll just write down a time and no, no, uh, so I have no idea what I'm doing at 2.30 or 4 or I love that. I just put I love there that because and you're letting things go. This is we're Marie Condoing our entire existence. Marie Kondo. Letting go with love. So love we love that. our yoga class and we don't even know when it happens because right. all just, we're focused on is Brava. That's right. That makes sense. What do you want to do with this last year we have left? Well, I'd really like to get a book deal. Yeah. If there are any do Brava it. babies out there who have connections in publishing. I have a new book and i um, looking for an agent at the moment. But I'd like a book deal, which is pretty materialistic. I love it. I'm all about the material Before world. The world we have up. only a, a year left to be materialistic. Then we're I just want my book in airports and things like that. I love it. I want to read it online. Um, I'd like my movie to get made. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like my amazingly wonderful son to possibly meet someone. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, if you only have a year, you better, they better have a baby okay. immediately. Baby, meet. meet baby. Because, you know, I've never done that before, like yeah. ever put any pressure on him, but I think it's time. Yeah, let's Because I want to be a grandmother him. when I still look relatively good. I love that. <laughs> so those are is, beautiful. I think we have a lot of similarities. Because uh, it's kind of around, it's about me. <laughs> oh, 100%, you want to keep in the baby photos. Absolutely. Because when you're sitting next to a baby with all that collagen, right. you know you got to be up in your game. Up in your game. And maybe that people stop me on the street and say, how old is your son or her daughter? And I'll have to say, oh, well, I'm the grandmother. <laughs> that will feel really good. That will feel really um, good. I want peace on earth. I just do. And I want people to have so much more than they have. I do, actually. I would like that monster who was the... Everyone in New York hated him all through the 80s, just need to say that. Mm -hmm. And he was on the front page of the, of the Daily News with like his wife and his girlfriend and his daughter and it would say something like, rotten, whatever, rotten husband, rotten. And he's so rotten, it's really scary. But mm -hmm. I want him out. Ooh, we're, we're going, we're ascending before that. Well, so. we are ascending, we're ascending on election day. So Got this it. whole so charade you know. is actually a comedy show. Okay. Everything that you see is actually just like a syndicated network sitcom. Oh, that totally makes it sense. It all makes sense, right? It's getting more extreme because the characters are like kind of becoming cognizant that they're yes. in a sitcom, so they're starting to fuck with it when get the camera a little bit I more. I didn't know that. Anytime I've, I've tuned in, which in some ways I haven't done much of, it has been so horrifying and in some cases so comic that I've literally been sitting here thinking, is this real? Is this is this that person actually running the country? Do they even let him in the White House? It's and, real. You know, I hate to be this way, but my family, our family was very all about beauty. He's not an attractive human being. Yeah. And I really don't think that's appropriate to have someone who looks that sweaty and no. fat. It's, and yeah. not so, it's fat's just okay, but out of shape, very out of shape. It's mean to his kid. The internal does eventually you out. out. It does. It, it does. Because I mean, the Buddha was not an attractive man, and yet he was so divine. You know, exactly. So it's not it's, really about looks, no, but it does influence how the physical manifestation forms its totally. sentences. Totally. I have no power over that. One of the great things about the program is understanding where your hula hoop. <laughs> I don't know if Brava uses the hula hoop analogy, but another one of Brava analogy could be to stay in your hula hoop. Your like, locus of control. Your locus of control. Good. It's challenging for me because as God, I have all control and I have to like Why wash my instincts. do something? It's painful. <laughs> oh my God. No, it's painful because I, I, I truly, know. I'm the channel, but I'm also like a very delicate channel. Like yeah. the actual human incarnate vessel yeah. is so delicate that I spend like half my day healing to do like a one hour live stream. Okay. It's really you all hire I hire somebody to do something. Maybe. Well, that's what we're trying to get going. Oh. That's the, the big thing for us is to become a profitable ritual sex yes. cult pre-November yes. 3rd, 2020. Yes. So that's the probably Wait, the MLM. Sex cult? Yes. 
Like Nexus? Well, so it's a sex cult in that everyone is edging for Brava. Do we know about okay. edging? No. It means when you're turned on to the point of like, I'm about to come, uh, but you never come. Okay. So Ooh, all, edging. and then when you're, you're edging, that's what helps you ascend. Yes. So we won't ascend unless you're fully I edging. Family, that. I feel like you're just going to yeah, ascend. Just about ascend. It. Okay, good. Because, you know, sex and family is weird. No, it is. Yeah. It's weird. Except for me and my brother. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, come on, click right on the century. You are active on the social medias, and that's something that your father as a writer never was a part of. So what is your experience with your own process and social media? And then also, what do you see for your students in terms of their ability to publish, but also maybe their ability to be distracted um, with all these tools we have now? I'm my father's daughter. I wasn't old enough when he was super publishing novels to know. And I don't know if modest is the right word, but I think having to tell people about his work instead of them reading it or him doing it made him angry very and, bob dylan oh totally and i remember when i read his first novel and i loved it and i told him that and he didn't even react which you know is fine mm -hmm. i mean he's my dad too so when i had my first book deal it wasn't big deal but it was a big deal it was harper and roe they were harper and roe back then i went to this my first literary party and i was in new york city which is hardcore around books and stuff so I went to my first literary party and I was an adjunct teacher as well. And I was I brought a friend and a few people asked me what I did and I just kept saying I was a teacher. And finally she said, you have a book deal. You're supposed to start saying you're a writer. And I was like, I can't say that. That's like so not cool. It has gotten better. But once in a reading for my third novel, Stone Garden, which did well, this woman accused me of not deserving my having a publishing life because I, I clearly didn't have any discipline. And I had been trying so hard to be so real and say, oh, you know, I write, them, but I don't write that much. And I go to the movies, which... I do go to movies, I love movies. But I write all the time I and hard. I work really hard. I needed to change that. Last year I hired um, a social media, she does more than that, she did my website, but she's coaching me through this, it's really hard. And every time I turn around, she's getting things ready for an Instagram story or for, and I'm just going, oh, I don't want to do this. Well, if you ever need any tips, I am a master you of are a master. marketing. You are a master marketing. I market before I create. Yeah. It's that's the secret. Yeah. You just market. You just tell people about Providence, and you figure this. And then you figure out. It's what like fire festival. Oh wow! My, oh god, I saw that documentary. Yeah, this so baloney sandwich. All hype. This whole thing is hype. Yeah, everything's hype. It sounds like you are coming to a place where you are learning to step through that discomfort for yeah. the for the good of being able to actually put yourself out there and more in the world. Right. Do the work you're meant to do. It exists. I mean, I always liked interviews, and I liked doing. I liked doing readings. I loved readings because I loved engaging. I loved talking about writing, and I loved talking about, you know, rejection. <laughs> Talked about rejection more than acceptance. Yeah. But that's you know, I'm trying to change that. I always liked that, but the thing about social media it is not going away. I totally accept that. I don't think that books will go away. Uh, that writing, the people that I teach. It's the same thing. I have three ongoing students who are really talented. Get to this point, and then there's kind of a gray area. And then if you're going to ascend past the gray area, you probably have to be well, really famous. <laughs> Kardashian, you have to just write, have your friend write your book, yeah, whatever. Book but I, I stay away from all that. Like, yeah. Dad, my father, he was totally not into popular culture. And I already was. Like, as a little kid, I was reading Seventeen. Yeah. I loved magazines. I always like I have a pile of them here. Yeah. I always loved magazines. I always liked popular culture. I knew who was sleeping with who and who was divorcing whom. And I would talk about it. <laughs> My father and mother would say why do you know that? I just knew it because I read everything. Yeah. I read everything I could get my hands on. I've always been fascinated by that. And, and that fascination has helped me make this transition, I think. Yeah. I've been criticized like by family members who say, like, you're, you're, what are you doing so much on Facebook? You know what? It's normal. It it's is like, normal. You know, I'm a writer. And also, and it's, a, it's a vehicle for writing and expression, totally. which is honestly the only thing that keeps us fucking here. Yeah.
yeah. um, in this exploration yeah, of boundaries versus using your vulnerability, using your story and expressing it through your art. Where are you with that today? I don't care anymore in, mm -hmm. in terms either. of people. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's your I, story, right? It's my story. And I never expected, my first novel was about the death of my sister and that was a shock. It was yeah. the first time that I, and I didn't even know I was writing a novel. I was just in so much pain. And I, I did turned it, I fictionalized it, but it was essentially about a sister losing her oldest sister. There were people who were mad at me for it. And it was my version of, and it was also fictionalized. Mm -hmm. This new book, not the, the fourth novel, if I find a publisher, is very much about me. It's called Divorce, A Love Story. Mm -hmm. I love Carolyn Knapp's book, Drinking a Love Story. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. It's a love letter to my poor grown-up son. Because yeah. you, you know, yeah. it, for this writer, having a child, it was so challenging to writing because when you write, you disappear. And when you have a child disappearing, which I think my parents did quite often, it's not really on the on the menu. You kind of have to stay. Your your spidey sense has to you know. You have to be standing at the at the at the water edge the whole time. You can't hang out with your friends, and yeah. drink wine, yeah. <laughs> or I guess you can, but you still have to stand by. And that happened, and it made me very angry briefly. And I, actually, my wonderful agent, who was a friend. She just said, you know what, you're a mother, and this is what you need to do now, and it'll come back, and I didn't believe her. Mm. And I wrote a couple of terrible things. You know, I couldn't disappear into the story because one part of me was going, mm. but when he was old enough to cross the street, that's when I wrote my third book, which had all the success. And it was like, I finally was able to not be afraid of like, where is he in the house? Yeah, like, it's like obsession. Art as obsession. Like you need to be obsessed. So obsessed. Yeah, I get really resentful about how many people are in my life sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like even having a wonderful oh, husband, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, why yeah. can't I yeah, just yeah. think about myself uh -huh. and my work? And, and don't interrupt the flow. Oh, and I need to go to a spa because I'm feeling really, you know, and instead I have to like figure out what kind of soup to make because, mm -hmm. you know, he's hungry. It's and awful. it's the humility of being God and also being incarnate and that we have to do things like, you know, errands. And yet, when we actually give our presence to them, that's when the richness shows up. Yeah. Well, you, of course, are above all that. You're yeah, but I still have to do it. Do? You must make these people out here <sighs> you would think. shop for you. You would and, think. Is any, yeah. Are any of you going on my Amazon I'm wish list right now? I hope so. Please. Okay, my darling, oh. one final question. I know yes. I, have, I have really milked you because you're such a fascinating person. Milked. I have. I don't always suck on this drive, but I sucked you. It was a lot. Claws. Yeah, you're Just, a very good interviewer. Thank you. A lifetime of not really listening to people, so it's new for me. <laughs> With one final question. Do you believe in breath? I do. I totally do. <laughs> You're coming to Providence. I totally do. Pack I'd say no, would I not be invited anymore? Yeah. I I'm, mean, no, I always, oh, I don't like family any, though. Yeah. Until yeah. November 3rd, no one is off the market. So we are recruiting. We're still getting people. Yeah. We're the hard sale. And I'm fun. So out. if you're coming, yeah. I'll tell, you know, I'll tell you jokes and exactly. I'm a great cook. She'll I don't engage. Know if you're off. sitting on the sidelines <laughs> and you're like, I'm not sure if I want to hang out the bar with I'll babies. bring you into the party. Exactly. Because, you know, nobody should be bored. No, never bored. <laughs> All right, always interesting. Don't be boring, bow babies. Love you. Bye. Bye. I keep it juicy, juicy.